Good afternoon, my name is Nikos. Welcome to the Great Sober Sex Forum. There we go. Um, forum is really something that kind of happened actually out of the reality of I was going to Flex. Uh, I was living, in, so we're living close to Flex, and I was going to Flex all the time. And I was posting some pictures and kind of crazy stories on, on one of the message boards in Facebook that... Uh, is more sexually explicit, but is in the 12 step program. And um, a lot of people start saying, Hey, I want to go to flex with you. I want to, I want to, I want to, you know, I, I need help. I need support. I need, and uh, the, the whole idea kind of came about, you know, wow, this is really, this whole sex thing is something that we really don't talk about that much, you know, in the rooms. Um, there are specific sex and sobriety meetings, but you know, that's a meeting. It's a meeting where somebody's sitting up here and they're just talking and they're saying this, you know, they're saying that, but it's not like a dialogue. And so, um, very quickly it started this idea popped in my head, which was, Hey, start, start a dialogue, get, get a conversation happening in the community. Because as we all know, sex is one of those things that takes more people out. You know, it's just, well, what happened? Uh, I had sex. Oh, <laughs> you know, and, and so, so that sort of begs the question of like, you know, are people being told that sex is bad, you know, and you know, you shouldn't do that. And no, you need 90 days. You need, you need X amount of time before you can. Right. Which is, which is all sort of, in my understanding, that's all fear-based recovery. That's I'm fearful of X, Y, Z happening. So I'm going to do X, Y, Z to prevent it or sponsors are going to tell me to do X, Y, Z to prevent because they don't want me to go. They, they have fear. And um, my sponsor, my first sponsor, who was a very faith-based sponsor, he was like, dude, you got to have sex. And you got to have it now and you got to have as much of it as you possibly can because you got to figure out who the fuck you are sober. He says, so I want you to A, pray. And I want you to B, have God. You do the online thing? I was like, yeah. And he said, all right, you got to erase all those profiles and allow God to rewrite them for you. And I was like, Okay, <laughs> and um, my first uh, profile, which I think was BBRT, was um, newly sober off of meth. Don't know if I'm a top or a bottom. Need kind, compassionate people to hand walk me through this process. And I had angels show up. You know, I was like willing to actually tell the truth of where I was at in my process <laughs> and what was happening for me. Just willing to be honest and willing to take divine direction and let those words of honesty kind of roll out and um, I had all these amazing amazing people show up in my life and sort of re-teach me you know re-explore and uh, they didn't have they didn't have um, uh, restrictions on how it was going to go down or you know I mean I didn't know if I could even get hard I just didn't know but um, you know being as though I had put that all out there to begin with you know and just kind of hey this is what's going on for me and so that whole this is what's going on for me is really kind of what I like to see happen here. Um, welcome to everybody who's looking, uh, who's listening to us in the internet. Um, we welcome you as well. Um, we wish you could be here, but you're here in spirit. Um, are there any other addicts or alcoholics present? Yeah. Cool. Why don't we um, say the serenity prayer together? God, grant the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. So um, we'll go around the room and introduce ourselves. So just use the first name and whatever title you want to identify as. Gabor, alcoholic. Johnny, alcoholic. Johnny. Greg, Greg. Mark, alcoholic. Mark. I'm Mark. Jay, alcoholic. Jay. Jericho, Christian, alcoholic. And Nikas, alcoholic who likes to shoot meth alcoholically. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the purpose for this forum is really just to create space to hold a dialogue, to actually, you know, give us all permission. And, that, you know, one of the things, and I think I mentioned to you guys, I'm doing this other process that doesn't have to do with alcoholic snacks, where you're actually holding space for people to really get honest and real with what's happening internally, their inner, their inner emotions and stuff. And, and I've really found that that's, that's what this journey is about. It's about sort of creating spaces for yourself, being able to go to places. And maybe it's not a meeting. Maybe a meeting is not where you're going to go and fucking fall apart, right? Or where you're going to go and tell your deepest, darkest truths. Maybe that's not it. 
But somewhere we need to have that. We need to have that place where we can actually go and expose. This is what's really, really, really going on to me. So the topic of today's um, forum is fear. And, um, you know, we're all on our unique journeys, but we've all got a few things in common and fear is one of those things. <laughs> so um, I prepared actually a little bit of a chat. So, so Gabor is going to speak um, prior to a break and then um, I'm going to come back and do a little chat on fear. I, I was in an accident a year ago, as a lot of you guys know, and, um, and I write now where I used to be a hairdresser. And my creativity for doing hair is like gone. My creativity for writing is um, just taken off. So that seems like what I do now. And I and, and the way I do it is, um, you know, I get like a little tap on the shoulder that says, hey, sit down and write. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I just stop whatever I'm doing and I sit down and I start writing. And this amazing stuff comes out. Sometimes it's stuff that I, that I know from my past, you know, things that I've heard, things that I've you know, and a lot of times, though, it's all sort of new information. It's kind of like it's for me, to me, through me, um, but but for me, you know. So, so I'll, I'll write it and then I'll look at it afterwards. Like, oh, and I'll reread it and I'll reread it and I'll reread it. And, and the fact that it actually came out of my fingers and the fact that I'm rereading it turns it into my knowledge. You know, it's like it's it's firsthand because it actually came out of me. But it's not necessarily something I knew before, so I'm, I'm starting to get this. That that you know, I mean, you know, when you when an artist creates some brand new painting or a hairdresser creates some brand new, you know, coloring technique or something, it's like it's never been done before. It's brand new. But that's how the the divine or creativity works. It's like it's all brand new. It's just happening, you know. So inside that you're tapped into it and you're just allowing brand new to come through you. Uh, or you're stuck in your old way of doing things. No, this isn't like the old way I do it. You know, I'm not going to do that. No, no, no. And I, you know, and which is, that's a one way to do it. But, you know, it's, it's far more fun to allow that expression of creativity through and to just be wowed by the outcome. So um, a few items from housekeeping. Um, whatever you hear here, just keep it here, right? Because the idea is we want to create a safe space for people to just be able to talk. And since we're going to be talking about fears today, who knows just how um, deep people will get. And if you can, you, you can share generally, hey, I went to this thing. Yeah, you know, people talk about it. People were pretty deep, yeah. But, you know, if you could just lay off saying, well, I heard so-and-so talking. Because that's just, that's, that's not good. It's not cool. And it's not, you know, we wouldn't want it to be for us. So, yeah. Um, if you are triggered, um, grab one of us after the meeting, you know, and, uh, and let's talk. Um, the idea here is that you can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, it's not like, you know, some of our, our, our fellowship sister meetings is like, you can talk about this, you can't talk about this. You, no, we want you to talk about whatever, but be respectful to everybody else in the room. But, but talk about whatever you need to talk about, you know, if, if talk about just get, get real, get honest. And if that happens to trigger somebody else, well, then that would kind of be what needs to happen for you. <laughs> so, you know, then take responsibility for that being triggered and take the next right action, which is grab one of us and let's talk about that. Let's investigate, right? I mean, this is, this is all a problem. I mean, nothing happens by accident. Everything, everything, you know, is because of God's hand is in it, <laughs> you know? And so, so we want to have a space where if, if you are triggered, you can talk about it. There's also a six o'clock sex and sobriety meeting where if you just want to hang out here for the afternoon for later on, um, that's great as well. We don't have a basket, but we will pass it. Um, $10 suggested donations, which uh, is to hold for the space here. Um, Gabor is going to be speaking for us today. Um, I've actually never heard his sexual story, but but um, we've gotten to know each other. And, uh, and I just thought, you know, this would be somebody who would be quite interesting because he's got, I mean, I have heard you speak about your, um, your old hairdressing stuff and all that sort of stuff. And I, I really related with all that sort of stuff because that was kind of who I was until I wasn't. <laughs> so um, I figured you can talk about that. You can talk about sex. So we'll let Gabor take it away. Please welcome you, welcome Gabor. 
Uh, my name's Gabor, and I'm an alcoholic, and I'm a drug addict, and I'm a pig, and all sorts of other things, but I just say alcoholic because it's easier. It just sums it all up. Uh, my sobriety date is September 12th, 1994, no, 1995, and so Monday I'll be 21 years sober. And the, But what we didn't go through, we, we all said our names, but we didn't say how long we're sober, so I'm kind of curious as to how long everyone here is sober, so if we can just... Go around and say how long you're sober. October 14th, how long? How long is that? Uh, 13. 13 years? How long? Um, two years and. Okay. You? Five months. Four months. You and uh, 20 months. Six months. Okay, great. So now I know what, what kind of a group I'm talking to. It's a big, large variety. You know, I was expecting it to be a bunch of newcomers, but it isn't. And that's good. Uh, but th the first thing is you have to get sober, period, without a doubt. I, I came in here when I was 21, and uh, for six years, uh, I tried to do it my way. And that meant, you know, it was, it was six years of hell, of total hell, of collecting newcomer chips. I had a bucket of newcomer chips. Um, I mean, seriously, it was like a real problem. And, uh, and everybody just knew that I was, you know, everybody would roll their eyes as I'd walk in, and this is what I thought, you know. And, and, and so it was a really hard time for me to fucking get sober. But when I, when I finally did get sober was by doing the steps, which is very important that you do the steps the way they're outlined in the book. Then I got sober. That was key. That was very, very key. And because before that, I would just try to do everything in the world to try to fucking stay sober, and it would just, it was a, I mean, a mess of everything. And uh, so that is the first thing, is you have to get sober, and do that however you have to. If that means not having sex, then don't have sex, okay? If that means have sex, then have sex. You know, but I don't know what it is for each of you. You have a sponsor, talk to them, and get honest and be real, so that you can get, get, get sober and stay sober. This is very important. And, and then, uh, you know, it was, I was 21 and I get sober at, at 26. So I was a baby, I was a little, little young child. And, and I came in here and I just, uh, boy, to talk about fears. I, I, was, I was riddled with fears, riddled with fears. And they, you name it, I was afraid of it. Um, and then I realized that uh, I was gonna be here. And, and this is basically my, my, my I'm going to be here for a while and I should figure out what, what the hell is going on. And, and they told me you can do anything you want to do and you can go anywhere you want to go. And, and, and so at, at six months of sobriety, um, I got an invitation to go to Fire Island. And that was like, oh my God, six months of sobriety, go to Fire Island. Everyone's like, don't go, don't go, you're, you're drunk, you're, you know. But I've never been to Fire Island. I want to go to Fire Island. And so I went to Fire Island. I had the time of my life, the time of my life. I didn't get sober. I mean, I didn't get drunk. I didn't get drunk. And, and that taught me really young that you can go anywhere and you can be anywhere. And I've never been drunk on Fire Island. And for a lot of people, Fire Island is a place to be drunk. And they're like, how do you, you know, they can't even go back to Fire Island because it's such a messy place. And most messy, messy, messy places have a, a center of recovery in them that is really profound. And so I found the meetings on Fire Island and I started going to the meetings. And, and, but I you know, fucked my brains out. I, I really did. I went there and I had a great time. Um, my contact has come out. And so that started this program, this, this slow process of figuring out what I want to do, who is it safe to do it with, and, and where am I going to, what, what, what can I do? And I really realized, slowly but surely, that, that I could do anything, go anywhere and fuck anything, go anywhere, and I can still be sober. And this was just a trip because a lot of my friends couldn't. They just couldn't. But I had my sobriety in place, and that was profound. I had my sobriety in place, and that was number one most important thing for me. And then I got to build on that. And since since that, I mean, I I mean, I have been just through some. I, I can't even tell you the the, the the experience that I had, you know, in a, in a room filled with people smoking crack, 
you know, and I'm sober, you know, people smoking pot, carrying on, doing their thing, but I'm sober, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna smoke it, I'm not gonna, you know, and, and I, I left there, and it was all, everything was fine, and that was a trip, that I can sit there and fuck some guy as he's sucking on a, on a glass pipe, and now, most people would not suggest that, they would, their, their response would be like, oh, no, 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 you can't, but, it does work. You, you can do it. It is possible. <laughs> Believe me, it is possible. And and so then I just started to realize that, that, that my sex life is one. It had to be. I, I had a bunch of different experiences with like sex. First of all, it, it can really get out of control. It can really get out of control if you don't watch your sex, your behavior around it, and who am I injuring, and how am I, you know, going about my sex. Then it's a, it's a mess. Then you can really make a mess of things. And I did that sober. And I made a mess of things. And I really, I don't say I almost drank, but I almost killed myself. Because I, drinking was out. You know, I know I'm not going to drink. I know I'm not going to drink, without a doubt. I'm never going to drink again. Because I just, I, I've, but to kill myself, that's a different story. Because that's a, a problem that I've had since I was like eight years old. And that's followed me into my sobriety. So I was in, at about 10 years sobriety, um, I was carrying on. I was doing my thing, and I thought I could fuck anybody. I was just, just making a mess of things, and and then I had to fucking stop. Basically, what happened with me is I uh, I got a syphilis sore, a big fat, big sore on my dick, and uh, and I had to go in and I shared about it at a meeting, and I couldn't even believe I was sharing about it. And I had to say, you know, my life is unmanageable. And the way I fucking had to stop sex is that I got a fucking big sore on my dick. And basically, that's how I stopped, is that I, I physically, you would not have sex with a guy. <laughs> <laughs> so then I was, then I was, okay, this, this has to stop. This can't be. This, you know, because I, and I looked at the, what I was doing, and I put my sex experiences through the inventory process again. Because I did that when I first did it. You know, the, the inventory process is re, uh, your resentments, your fears, and your sex conduct. Very important that you do all three. And I did the sex conduct at first, okay? But now I have to do it again. And I realized I was really being absolutely selfish about the way I was having sex. I was just, it was about get my nut off and fuck you. And who cares? You weren't even in the equation. And that is just, uh, one, I couldn't believe I'd gotten there, you know, but, but I had allowed myself through repeated offenses to get to that place. And, and so then I had to, then I was, you know, with this giant sword and, and I had to stop and I did. And, and I put the, my whole life went through this process of what's going on, what am I going to do now? And then I had to redo my sex life. You know, I had to re establish what is good for me and what is good for you and and how am I going to do this so that we are both going to enjoy this if now for me if, if you're not enjoying yourself I'm not having a good time I'm, it's just plain and simple if you're not enjoying yourself I'm not gonna I'm not having a good so I have to I have to stop and so I then stop and, and this is very different than the way I used to have sex because the way I used to have sex was just it was, it, was, it was very bad. It was very bad. And it was very selfish, very one-sided. But then I brought in the, the other side, and the other person is, is the other partner. And then all of a sudden, they, they became this, this real open, and it's not even that there's like a lot of talking, we don't have this big old, you know, share about what's happening, but it's just my, my intentions of the moment is for us both to enjoy ourselves. And out of that has come just a, a pretty fabulous sex life. And now, also, I need to talk about uh, my marriage, uh, because I've been in a monogamous relationship, and I've been in open relationships, and this is my opinion. I think we were put on this earth, okay, as the male species, to keep us alive, and that means spill your seed wherever you can, however you can. And a woman is much more nurturing, being at home, taking care of the baby. But I'm, as a male, I'm driven by this 
force that's outside of me. And I used to really go to go crazy because I would be like, I'm cheating on him. Why am I doing this? God, I would get, beat myself up and beat myself up. And, and it wasn't even about that. It was about me just getting to, to terms with, I just want to get off. I just need to get off. And I love my husband. I, he is, I, I swear, he's just a really great guy. But it's separate. Our sex life and our love life is separate. It's very, it's, and now we include each other in both of them. And it's very open and it's very, very sane. And it's very safe. And it's, and it's I, I think it's the way to go. I don't know. Try it. Some people don't believe this. Some people are, oh, no, nope, one person for your life. But I wonder how they do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because after about five, seven years, okay, you start fucking, you start looking and you start wanting. And you drive and just throw that horse shit away. You know, it's it's not about being bad. It's not about being, you know, not uh, spiritual. It's not about it's it's the way I'm built. I'm built as a human being to procreate. And unfortunately, it's not with a woman, okay? Because I'm gay, and so it's with a man. And that process of being okay with that has really freed me, has freed me completely. And and today I'm I'm totally cool with it. I'm totally cool with with uh, my sex life and, and how I am with other people. I'm open to talking about it. I'm opening to whatever. It's all okay because this is what I had to do to get here and stay here. And I'm I'm sober now, almost twenty one, almost twenty one, and, and I don't think I'm gonna change it. Because uh, it's working, it's really working right now. And I'm trying to think what else I want to say. So fears in the beginning really were were baffling because I I, I would have these fears about everything, about anything, about everyone. And then when I started to realize that everyone has them, there isn't a person alive that does not have these fears. And everybody has them for something else. And everybody, you know, you can find the most beautiful man in the world, okay, that's perfect in your eyes. But I guarantee you, he's got an idea of what's not perfect on his body. You know, and, and so everybody's got this. Everybody has this. And it's about becoming okay with yourself and saying, this is what I have, this is what I, I'm going to be, that I have to work with, I'm going to try to make the best I can out of it, and somebody else is attracted to it. And that, that was a trip, because I was, I was in a bathhouse once, and I was, I saw this big muscle guy, and he came in, and I thought, oh my god, there, there is he, that's the one, that's the one, and I chased him like crazy, and he would not give me the time of day. And then all of a sudden, I saw him with a skinny little Asian boy. And he was going back to the room. Well, I don't care what kind of workouts I do. I am not going to be a skinny Asian boy. I don't care <laughs> how much. I just, I'm not. Okay. And then I, then I realized, oh, that's what he likes. Okay, that's good. That's fine. That's what he likes. And then I realized that there's plenty of fish in the sea. And everybody likes something some of them will like me, some of them won't, and it's all okay. And everybody's got something about themselves that they don't like. Everybody has something about themselves that they don't like. As do I. Okay, but hey, this is what God gave me, and I'm going to go forward with what I got. And so being okay with that, and that, this took a, took a long time, a long time to get there, uh, to really get okay with that to really believe that this is this is cool and and so now i'm there and i, and I oh god the, the amount of the hours and the years i spent in my bare brain about this just was insane insane and so now i'm i'm, I'm much more at peace <laughs> and much more easy about it and and, I, and i'm having more sex now than probably ever in my life okay and i mean ever and it's 
I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but I think it's just because I've become more comfortable with myself. I've become more attuned with what I am. I've become more one-on-one -on -one with what I have to offer and what you have to offer. And, and I'm not wrapped up in this whole, I gotta get that one, I gotta get that one. Because one, that one might not be for me. You know, they, they might not be into me. And so with that, I've just got this flow, this give and take, and uh, and it's working. It really is working, and, and I don't know what it is. It's, I'm now 47, so I'm almost 50, okay? And I really thought, you know, I look at like 20-some years old, 20 year olds and I'm like oh that, that's that, that's perfect I wish I could be like that I wish I could be. but I realized that they they are not having the amount of sex that they want to have because they have all this other shit wrapped up in their head okay. it's true because I was there I was the same way I had the fears and all this other shit wrapped up in my head and I was all fucking worried about it and so so now I, I take my I take my time to to comfort them, so. <laughs> but um, I think that's about it. I don't know what else I can say. If you guys have questions, I'd, I'd be happy to answer anything you have to anything you have to say. And uh, I think that's it. Cool. All right. Well, maybe then, um, maybe I'll just talk, talk about fear. So you talked a lot about fear. Maybe I'll just um, rather than just take a break and then come back. Um, we'll just talk about that. Um, uh, so, right, if, um, if desire is the memory of pleasure, right, um, Meaning that, like, if it's Saturday night and I'm thinking about getting laid, and you know, and I'm thinking about what it felt like to get laid, and I'm gonna just, you know, it feels like what it's gonna, like, des desire is is the memory of the pleasure, right? So, I I want more of that, right? Um, then, from that line of thinking, um, fear is the memory of pain, right? So, so fear is the memory of the thing I don't want. So, desire is a memory of the thing that I want. Right? I mean, whereas human beings, we're all sort of wired, hardwired, that I want more pleasure, I want more of the good stuff, I want more of the stuff that, that works for me. And I want less of the things that don't work. You know, I'm just, I'm trying to move away from that. So with that sort of mentality, it's like, that, that, that's, that's all the fear is. It's just like, so, and when I say a memory of pain, it, it can be just simply uncomfortableness, you know, some sort of mental uncomfortableness. That um, you know that I don't want that. I don't want more rejection. You know, I want more of not rejection. You know, I, but but the, the things that I've that, that in the past that have happened that are uncomfortable mentally, I want less of that. And so fear really is just the mechanism that my brain uses to sort of keep those things away. Um, there's two primary types of fear. One is physical and one is um, psychological. Um, physical fear is, um, ah, the bus. When you step off the street corner and almost get hit by a bus. Um, or when you're walking up to the edge of a cliff and you're like, ah, it's really fucking far. Right? Um, that's, that's physical fear. That's, that's something that you can actually see. You can point at and you can say, okay, that thing right there, if, if I move towards that, that, that could be bad. Um, psychological fear, on the other hand, so um, I use it. So if I scream "ah shark" and I'm in the water and I see a shark fin, that's a physical fear. If I'm on dry land and I'm like "ah, I don't want to go in the water. I think there's sacred sharks in there." That's a psychological fear. Or uh, when I was a kid, my girlfriend used to she used to turn the um, the light of the pool off at night when I was in there by myself. And because she liked to watch me scream like a bitch. <laughs> I would scream and yell and I'd get out of that pool so fucking fast because I was for sure there were sharks in it, right? Or something that was going to eat me. But reality is 
is probably not anything in a pool at night when you just had the lights on <laughs> and now they just turned off. There's probably not anything in the pool. Most likely. There could be. Some really off fucking chance. But it's, it's really the story that my head creates that's the problem about being in a dark pool at night. Um, the one other type of, of, of fear is, is anxiety. And um, anxiety is one of those things that um, I can have the physical feeling of fear, like my hands can get sweaty and my pits can perspire and my breathing can get rapid. Um, you know, all that can happen because um, I like this definition of anxiety. The physical manifestation of the fear of the thing that's not happening. The physical manifestation of the fear, right? So I'm physically manifest, you know, the, of the fear of the thing that's not happening. So the thing that's not happening right off the bat tells you it ain't fucking happening. It's not for real. So all this physical manifestation is my mind working against me. Un I mean, I could say working against me. It, you could say working for you if it's, you know, if it's a valid fear or a good fear, but you know, or verified fear, but quite often most things aren't verified. You know, there, there's, there's, there's no verification process with fear. And, um, you know, fear is not happening. So, um, the other thing is like, fear, fear is just a thought. Fear is just a, a, a thinking process, right? So fear, so false evidence appearing real, right? So evidence is my line of thinking, or my, um, what I'm using as factual evidence to um, prop up the reason why something's not good or something's fearful. But you know, if, but when we said physical fear, I can point at the evidence. That's the evidence, that's the evidence, that's the evidence. But in the psychological fear, the only evidence is my mind giving me these ideas of what it doesn't want. Right. And, and that's that's where things get questionable. It's like because this stuff actually I believe it. You know, I actually believe what my head tells me. And so then I base uh, I, I base decisions on on that. So if I have false evidence appearing real and um, I'm going to actually use this false evidence to to to, to allow me to make choices or to not make choices in some cases. Um, you know, in, in the big book, it says fear ought to be classified with stealing. It seems to cause that much trouble. And, and um, I first read that, I, I was like, well, what do they mean by stealing? And my sponsor says, well, fear robs you. It robs you of what's actually possibly yours. Because what happens is we go through this mental process about, um, you know, what I will or I won't do based upon this false evidence. So, so I like to use the example. I go to the gym, I'm working out. The most beautiful guy is walking across the gym. He's young, beautiful, you know, just stud. And I think, oh my God. And, and, and literally inside me, this, the, the actual thing that happens to me is I see that and I, and I go, oh, I just, I want to cry. And that wanting to cry when I've actually done the investigation, done the work, and like, what is that? And follow the thread, follow the thread. And what that is, is it is my mind telling me that you're not worthy. You'll never have that. That's beyond your capability. Not this lifetime, motherfucker. And so this sadness sort of comes up, you know, and like, oh. But... You know, the, 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 the evidence that my mind uses is, well, A, you are in a motorcycle accident and you have a limp. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're fucking broken merchandise because you walk around with a limp. I mean, who the fuck wants a limpy guy? Um, you have a heart-lung problem because you shot too much drugs. Um, I got this pulmonary arterial hypertension, so I can't fuck like Superman anymore. And, you know, of course, he's young and he would want Superman. And I can't, I'm not that guy anymore. I just can't, I can't be that guy. Oh, and you're old. <laughs> You know, you're old. Um, and he's not. And so it's like he's got all this and I'm lacking all that. And so my mind um, tells me, 
yeah, you'll, you can't ever have that. So, so, so the false evidence or the untrue thought is all of those things I just said. The untrue action that I would take on that thought is to not ask the guy out, is to not introduce myself, is to not start a conversation because I'm trying to move away from <laughs> rejection. I want less of that. Um, and I'm trying to move towards non-rejection. And so the way I can do that is by actually making the decision not to go say hi, because I know that I will have not be rejected if I don't say hi. So untrue thought, untrue action, I get an untrue result. And when my sponsor said, you know, fear already classified with stealing is because it robs you your right to your fucking reality. It robs you the right to what's actually possibly yours because you as, as a, as a thinking machine that's believing everything you're thinking, right, are basing your life. You're actually creating your reality through fear. And I mean, really, so one of the things we do in AA is we, we do a fear inventory. And the reason we, we, we put our fears down on paper, right? I mean, the reason we do an inventory process is to have a, an honest look at stuff. So when I actually have an honest look at my fears, I give them a beginning, a middle, and an end, and then I share them with somebody else. And I use that other person as a mirror. And, 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 and a sponsor, or a good friend, or a spiritual advisor, right, can, can mirror back to you things that you can't see inside yourself. Or you know, even a group like this, when we talk about fears later. It's like, you know, it's just, just getting it out sometimes. Is, is the process of actually just talking about it, or writing it down, inventorying it, just getting it out. It takes away the power because inside of our heads, we have this like nonstop, like it's just a merry-go-round. Right? But when I put it down on paper and I look at it, and then I have to tell you about it, it's like, ah, oh, it just doesn't seem like the truth anymore. You know, but, but if it's in my head, it seems like it's the truth. I'm not going to fight with my own ideas, but when I see my ideas on paper, I'm like, that's kind of silly. And when I have to tell somebody else, <laughs> oh, that's even sillier. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah. So fear works in so many ways. It's like fear, fear can um, fear can be the reason why we don't ask somebody out, why we don't get what we want, um, why we don't try new things, why we don't go to a bathhouse. We're scared we'll get loaded. I mean, you know, it's like um, why we won't you know do new things in bed because we're afraid we can't do it. Um, fear can be why we don't go online. Uh, it can be, it can rob us of so many, 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 many things in life. And um, that's what, you know, for me, the process of getting sober was like, in, in spiritual awakening for me is like, I've, I've awake out of the sleepiness of like living in untruth and I awaken into living into truth. Like, like I'm, I'm, I get so sick and tired. So, so when I was not sober and not spiritually awake, my mind would tell me, oh, you know, it's going to be different this time. You, you can get drunk or you can get, you get high or you, know, you can get fucking high on Saturday and make it to work on Tuesday. It's just never turned out to be the case. <laughs> just never turned out to be right? So, so I, my mind would tell me untrue things and I would actually believe the untrue thoughts that my mind would, would, would tell me. But when I've sort of spiritually awoken and through, you know, doing 11 step stuff, which is, you know, you know, having this conscious contact, creating this conscious contact where I, I literally ask to see the truth and then I'm shown the truth um, and then I can turn towards the truth. Actually, it's, let me, I, um, oh, my sponsor, you know, my sponsor was a great guy or is a great guy. Um, he, um, he told me, you know, God can do anything that you can't do for yourself. And, and I thought, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test that. I'm going to test that right there. So um, when he told me I had to have a, a daily prayer and meditation practice, and I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm willing to do that, but here's the deal. I can't remember to do it. So I, I can't remember, and, 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 I, and, I, and I certainly don't want to use, like, these really silly AA prayers because that just doesn't, it doesn't seem real for me. 
So I said at night, the night before, I usually get up at 5.50 to make it to the 7 a.m. meeting. So I get up at 5.50 to get out of the house on time. And um, that night before I went to bed, I said, all right, God, dude, I'm willing to do this, but I need, I, you You got to remind me to do it. You got to remind me to wake up and, and, and actually do it. And then but the other thing I need is I need actual real prayers that's like me talking to you that's like this we have this thing because I don't want to read some scripted prayer thing that's you know third step prayer or seventh step or which are prayers right um I just I wanted some authentic something from me so I said so I'm willing I believe good night went to bed woke up 5:45 five minutes early beep and I had this uncontrollable urge to just tumble out of bed and tumble onto the floor. I had this um, like little sheepskin carpet. And it was just like, I was just literally, I was drawn, I was pushed to get out of bed. And so I did. And I got on, I got on the carpet and I um, was kind of kneeling. I said, okay, good morning, God. And um, out of my mouth, I'm going to tell you the prayers that came out of my mouth, and it blew me the fuck away. Out of my mouth came, God, please show me the truth today of every situation, whether it be inside my head or whether it be out in front of me. Please show me the truth and give me the courage and the strength to always turn towards that truth in which you show me. And God, the other thing I need is I need moment-to-moment consciousness. I need real-time awareness, like right here, right now, like in the now. I need to be kept in the now so that I can differentiate the true from the false and so that I can see myself being myself in all the ways that myself likes to be myself and that I miss and avoid that self because I'm too much in self. <laughs> so I need moment to moment consciousness to keep me in that now where I can see myself being myself. And I thought to myself, holy shit. Now that's a prayer, right? So he's showing the truth, um, and I need, to re- I need real time. I need real time, you know, like right now. And um, and and that prayer for me turned out to be like I, I call it the prayer for awakening because really that's what spirituality and spiritual awakening is. It's a, it's it's about being able to deal with life in a truthful manner. So this stuff that's in my head generally. 99.9% this is fiction. Anything I can point at out there, that's a fact. Now, if, if for some reason that fact doesn't match my fiction, um, and I get upset about that, that's like, that's like the most ridiculous, it's like, that's reality. This is non-reality. I'm trying to fight reality with non-reality. Who the fuck do you think is going to lose? You shouldn't fucking do that. But they did. (laughs) You know, but they did. So for me, spiritual awakening has really been all about coming to the state of like just a state of yes. There's a there's a there's a a teacher, a spiritual teacher that I I follow. I can't remember his name at the moment. But his definition of spiritual awakening is um, coming into a state of absolute cooperation with the inevitable. So the inevitable is life as life is happening, as life as life is unfolding. It is inevitable I will lose a job. It is inevitable I will get stood up. It is inevitable that I'll get a motorcycle accident because I've rode a motorcycle for a long time. <laughs> you know, there are certain things that are just inevitable. And either I can be in cooperation with those things, or I can just be, ah, oh, yes. Or I can be, no, 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 you know, and just like in constant conflict with those things. And so as I've sort of awoke into the truth of reality, everything I can point out there, that's the truth. And being in a state of cooperation just means, ah, okay. Hey, do you want to do a hit of meth? Well, being in cooperation means, oh, okay. Yeah, totally unexpected. Didn't see that coming. Thought we were on a date to have a nice little meal. So, um, but the answer to that is no, but thank you for asking. Um, I'm a sober guy and I'm going to split. So that's kind of cooperation. That's, that's being in somewhat kind of cooperation with reality. 
Um, non-cooperation is, what the fuck are you doing? I'm fucking sober. Don't you know who I am? What the fuck? I can't believe you do that. Right? Which, which that gives me a very narrow ability <laughs> to do stuff. You know, it's like, I'm probably not going to make the, the smartest decisions when I'm in that kind of like pissed offness and that kind of anger and not. But when I just kind of stay in the state of like, oh, okay, well, yeah. Um, no, <laughs> because I wouldn't sleep for fucking uh, two months. <laughs> But yeah, go ahead, knock yourself out. Now and now I know what this person is all about. I, I didn't know that before. So spiritual awakening is really coming into this place of like seeing life for what life is and not trying to fucking change it. You know, just it's like, oh, okay, yes. Um, I, I was looking online, I found this acronym for fear. Because, you know, at some point, we just get tired of, like, my mind tells me these stories, and I just, I'm tired of, like, believing the story of, like, it'll be different this time, you can get high today. I get tired of that. You know, and I got really, really tired at one point that my mind's saying that you're not good enough, that you're, you know, it's like what you said about, like, at some point, you just, you just, yeah, this is what I got. This is who I am. This, this is who I am. This is what I got. I could drag this shit to the gym more if, I, if that's what I feel like, you know. But, but this, is, this is what I have. And it's not trying to, like, pretend that I want something different. It's about coming into that, you know, like, this this is who I am. And so when I finally got to that point, you know, other than the sobriety, but I got to that point in so many other places in my life, I was like, okay, this fear thing? This has just got to go. So I just, I kept asking to see the truth of every situation, right? Because the truth isn't necessarily what I'm thinking. But I need to see the truth so I can actually turn towards it rather than, you know, miss it. Um, I found this great acronym online for fear that kind of illustrates what happens when um, when we're just done with the whole thing. And it was, um, you know, there's the false evidence appearing real. There's, I like this one, fuck everything and run. But this one, when I saw it, I actually, I started crying because I was like, that's it. That's that's the one right, right there. Um, it says, face everything and recover. And I was like, oh my God, that's it. Like, so when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm done, when I'm done with the bullshit and I'm ready, I'm ready to just face, right? So to just embrace whatever, whatever the truth is, just turn towards it, open myself to face everything and recover and just be ready to allow it to be. Um, one of the other things I've, I've, I've really realized about fear is if I'm living in fear, I'm not living in faith, right? It's one or the other. It's, it's, it's not degrees of. <laughs> it's like, no, it's either this or it's that. There's, there's no, like, degrees or whatnot. It's just one is the fear is the absence of faith. When I'm in faith, fear has no place. None. It just simply goes away. But faith, really, it turns out, it's like to, to be in faith, that's, it takes a lot of balls because that means that I have to be willing to like allow that whatever the inevitabilities are in life, whatever those inevitabilities are, those are going to be the correct things that are supposed to happen for this guy. Right? I was in this motorcycle accident last year. It was like, it was inevitable. I didn't fight it. It just was... That was what it was. And, it was uh -huh. and there was a huge learning. I mean, when I fell into this cooperation with this thing, I was in a coma for three weeks and went away to coma land, had this near-death experience, came back and was like, everything sort of reshifted away in my head. It was like, oh, oh my God. I I'd, I'd complete, I'd, I, would, I was missing the mark before. <laughs> I, I, was, I had this idea of how things were, but that idea is like, it's non-existent. This is reality. You know, what's God's will? Look around. Anything you can point at is God's will. Anything. Guy cutting you off and flipping you off, God's will. <laughs> Why? Because it happened. Because it actually fucking happened. My will is always a negotiation with. A things would be better if. A if only this, then that. My will is always this state of imagination that's other than reality or this state of imagination that's imagining a future that has nothing to do with right now. <laughs> My will is this crazy place that doesn't do anybody any services. So when I drop my will 
and I just fall into divine will. Divine will is anything I can see, anything I can do, anything, right? So when I get these little taps on my shoulder, okay, you need to write this thing. You need to, okay, sure, I'll fucking write, you know? Because for me, I was in, um, I was in a meditation, I don't know, about eight months ago, and um, I said, okay, I, I get it, you're trying to get me to fucking do some sort of teaching thing. That I just, I don't, I don't, how the fuck am I supposed to get from here to there? I don't, I don't understand. I'm going to do a school, what do I got to do? And, uh, and I got full sentences, which I don't usually get full sentences, but full sentences like, look, you do what we ask you to do with intuitive integrity. Actually, after I got out of meditation, I looked up integrity because I was like, I kind of know what that word means, but not really. Um, and, and the second definition for integrity was um, with a sense of um, wholeness and undividedness. So the direction was, you do what we tell you to do with a sense of wholeness and undividedness, which means you stop whatever you're doing, you fucking do not pass go, you sit down, you fucking write, motherfucker, and we tell you to practice this thing and, it, you know, to, 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 to sit and, and talk this thing out and re- you, that's what you do. I'm like, oh, okay. Or, you know, that, that's what you do because that, I said, and don't worry, we'll just take care of the rest. I was like, okay, all right. And it just really seems like that seems to, to, to work in life in, in so many modalities. It's like, if I just do whatever I'm integrity, what, what does intuition say? Right? So intuition is like the divine's way of talking to us. So if intuition is saying, go talk to this person, go talk to him. You know, even if fear tells me something different, intuition says, go say hi. Because, you know, I might see this hot guy at the gym. I might not go say hi because I want to save me and him the fucking... But who knows, this guy might actually want an older daddy guy who's, who's you know, got a little healthy problems because he's got some health problems that I can't see. Just as I have health problems that he probably can't see, he might have health problems that I can't see. And it might actually be a perfect fit. Might be. It's just, I mean, there's a possibility. There's always this possibility out there. So... Face everything and recover. <laughs> that really, I, it's just when I saw it, I really just wanted to cry because that's that's what this is about. That's what this is about here. That's what this is about. That's what AA is about. That's what everything is about. Is about facing everything, coming into the actual actualness of the truth of it. Because only when we're actually honest with stuff, only when we actually face things, only when we actually are willing to move through stuff, are we actually can we actually change? Can we actually get better? So let's take a little break and um, take 50 minutes. We'll come back in 50 minutes and we'll, uh, we'll share about this thing. So, so if you got any uh, anything you want to talk about, or if something comes to you on the break, you know, if you want to write it down or just remember, just remember it. So, so we can talk about it after the break. All right. Just missed. Uh, 